In a letter to a man named Nathaniel Mason, Thomas Jefferson said, and I quote, Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. I'm not sure I would agree with Thomas Jefferson that it's the first chapter because the book of wisdom in the Bible, the book of Proverbs, clearly says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. However, he is right that honesty is in the book of Proverbs. Now, what do you say about honesty? You, I guess you'd be for it. You'd be against it. Which reminds me of a story I heard years ago about a fellow who went to church. I can't remember who it was, but as I recall, it was a rather famous fellow. And he got home and his wife said, uh, what did the preacher preach on? And he said, sin. And he said, what did the preacher say about it? And he said, he was against it. <laughs> now, if you bring up the subject of honesty, I guess you're for it. And you're against dishonesty, right? So what's there to say about honesty? Uh, maybe a better question is, what does the book of Proverbs say about honesty? So as you can guess by now, what we're going to do today is talk about honesty in the book of Proverbs. I'm going to begin by talking about definitions, as I often do in this series. And then I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about honesty, and then I'm going to talk about what the book of Proverbs says concerning dishonesty. That's sort of the natural division of this subject, isn't it? All right, let me start with some definitions. The Hebrew word uh, for honesty, and the word does appear in the English translation, but the Hebrew word actually means justice, judgment, right. And so that's the way it's usually translated in the book of Proverbs. The English word honesty means trustworthy or truthful or genuine and it has to do with moral character, the way we would uh, probably refer to it. And it would include negatively not lying, cheating, or stealing. Now, that's the word honesty. The word dishonest appears in the book of Proverbs. The Hebrew word, oddly enough, means to seek treachery. It only appears eight times. Uh, the English word means to behave in an untrustworthy or fraudulent way. Uh, deceitfulness shown in someone's character or behavior. Now, I think if you ask a child, uh, children, what is honesty, they would probably say something like, well, that means you don't lie. Well, that's certainly included. But what I'm trying to say is that honesty includes more than that. It includes your moral character. It has the idea of not doing things that are morally wrong. So it's bigger than just not telling a lie. All right, with that in mind, what then does the book of Proverbs say about being honest? Well, here's one of the first things I discovered that I uh, had studied the passage before, but I don't think it quite stuck. Uh, the perp one of the purposes of Proverbs is to teach honesty. In Proverbs, uh, Chapter 1, verse 3, which is part of the preface of the book, Solomon lists a number of things he wants to accomplish. One of them has to do with honesty. So I'm going to read verse 3 of the first chapter. To receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Now I mentioned a moment ago, that the Hebrew word translated honest means judgment or justice. And that's the case here. In Proverbs 1.3, it's translated judgment. 
But what you need to note is that this is in a list of things, he says, is the purpose of the book. They all start with two, 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 two. Those are the purposes of the book. So one of them has to do with honesty. And sure enough, the book of Proverbs talks about honesty. For example, Proverbs 2, 8 says, He guards the path of the just. Now that's the Hebrew word honest. He guards the path of the word just and preserves the way of his saints. In other words, God protects saints from doing evil. Those especially who are committed to uh, doing what is honest. Now, uh, the word honest appears some 20 times in the book of uh, Proverbs. You understand what that means? If it appears 20 times and dishonest appears 8, that's 28 verses. If I did, uh, it takes at least, you know, two or three minutes per one. We could be here for a while. <laughs> I don't intend to go through all of those. But I just thought I would mention what the book of Proverbs talks about a lot is something called the path of honesty. As a matter of fact, the idea is that you take the path of honesty. It's mentioned in 2 9, 8 20, 17 23, and 21 3. It warns against taking the path of dishonesty. Now, I don't expect you to remember all this, I just want to give you a feel for what the book of Proverbs does with this word. That appears in 1323, 168, 185, 1928, 217, 2115, 24, 23, and 285. And then there are three times that it talks about honesty in relationship to being a king. And since I didn't think we had any kings in the audience, I decided <laughs> not to deal with those verses. Now, what I've done is just survey the scene so that we don't have to go through each of those verses. Feel better? Shorter message. All right. The point is the book of Proverbs talks about honesty. It's one of the purposes of the book. Now, beyond that, what the book says about honesty is really interesting. If I were going to sum it up, and there are, we'll look at the verse or two, but uh, the idea is that honesty has to do with your relationship with the Lord. Honesty pleases the Lord. So I think that sort of sums up uh, what the book says, the book of Proverbs, says about honesty. For example, in 1611, it says, honest weights and scales are the Lord's, and all the weights in the bag are his work. Now, this little verse is going to take some uh, explanation. So let me see if I can explain. Honest weights and scales. What in the world does that mean? Well, in a very simple term, and I'll get into more of this in a minute, uh, it's, it's measurements. Uh, isn't there a Bureau of Measurements in the United States where uh, the, the exact measurement is on store, right? Well, God has his Bureau of Measurements. That God has some standards of what is honest, he has a bureau of management. As a matter of fact, now this is not in the Bible, but apparently there were those standards in the temple. Now we know that from history, not the scripture, but I found that very fascinating that the Jews had a bureau of standards, a bureau of measurements, and they kept it in the temple. But this appears... Uh, speaks directly to business because where weights and scales were used was in business. So what this is saying is God has some standards 
for business practices. Is that interesting or what? That's what the book of Proverbs is teaching about honesty. That if you, if you have the right measurement, uh, you're not using the scale to cheat somebody that pleases the Lord. That's the point of 1611. Honest weights and scales are the Lord's and all the weights in the bag are his work. Now, let me put this in perspective. Did your mother teach you honesty? I mean, isn't that sort of mother 101? <laughs> you know, don't lie. That's why kids think honesty is just about lying. But they want you to be honest, right? Okay. Uh, that's mother. Uh, government would tell you when it comes to business practices, which is the point of this proverb, that you better be honest. And if you aren't, then that's a crime. So mothers are interested in honesty and government is interested in honesty. Then I think wise people in general would say you ought to be honest. There's an old proverb that says, honesty is the best policy. Do you remember who said that? Does any name pop into your head when I say? Benjamin Franklin is the name that pops into your head. Now, I, I decided to quote him, but I thought I should look that up first. And apparently it was a proverb before he put it in the almanac or something. <laughs> At any rate, it goes back to 1500s. But that's a wise saying. So mother says be honest, government says you better be honest, wise people would say it's the best policy, and that's the point. It's bigger than all of that. God says that you ought to be honest, and that's what pleases him. Now the fact that it pleases him is going to be emphasized in spades before we get done. But that's the point. The one thing I think the book of Proverbs says about honesty is that the Lord pays attention to this. So we got to relate this subject to the Lord and it pleases him. Let me illustrate. In John chapter 1, there was a man named Nathaniel. John 1.47 says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Jesus took one look at Nathanael and said, An Israelite in whom is no deceit. Now, why did he call him an Israelite? Well, he was Jew and that was common. But you remember who the original Israel was? Jacob. Remember God changed Jacob's name to Israel? And what can you tell me about Jacob? Oh, he was a conniver, that boy. <laughs> he was a schemer. And so Jesus looks at Nathanael and says, Behold, an Israelite, a descendant of Jacob, in whom there is no deceit. Interesting. Here's a genuine man. Here's an honest man. Do you know of anybody you would say that of? That, that it's just their character. And you would say, that's an honest person. Well, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. Now, the reason I use Nathaniel is, my point is, the Lord is pleased with honesty. And the one great illustration in the Bible, I think, would be Nathaniel. Tom... Cook and Joe Freeney were friends. Tom and Joe and their wives took trips together in their small PT Cruiser convertible. In 1992, Joe and Tom made an agreement. They agreed that if either one of them ever won the Powerball jackpot, they would split it down the middle. And they shook hands. No contract, no written agreement. They just shook hands on it. 28 years later, that'd be 2020, 
recently, Tom won the Powerball jackpot worth $22 million. Now, <clears throat> Tom lived in the metropolis uh, called Elkmont, Wisconsin. I never heard of it. Obviously a very small town. And so he called his friend Joe, who lived in another very small town, to tell him, we got to split the $22 million. Would it have been easy for him to pocket the whole purse? But he didn't. He was honest. Now, I tell that story simply to say, that's the kind of thing God would smile on and say, that pleases me. Whatever happened to the agreement confirmed by a handshake? Do we do that anymore? Yeah. At any rate, the book of Proverbs talks about honesty. And the first thing it says is, this is of concern to the Lord, implying it pleases him when you are honest. Now, I said I was going to talk about two things. Honesty on the one hand and dishonesty on the other. As a matter of fact, when the book of Proverbs discusses honesty, it has a lot to say about dishonesty. Now, I mentioned a minute ago, just in survey fashion, all the references to honesty. And basically the idea was take that path. This is of concern to the Lord. But when it gets to dishonesty, it says three very significant things. So, just made for a Baptist preacher. Three points. There are three sub-points, but there are three points. All right, what does the book of Proverbs say about dishonesty? Number one, it is disgusting to the Lord. And it not only says that once, it says that three times. So let's look at them. First of all is Proverbs 11.1. 1. Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Now, the latter part of that proverb is what I just said. It pleases the Lord. He smiles on honesty. But this proverb gives the other side as well. Dishonesty, and in this case, dishonest scales are an abomination. Now, if you've been listening to me as we've been going through the book of Proverbs, you've heard me say, I don't know how many times now, that the word abomination in the book of Proverbs means disgusting, repugnant. It's repugnant to the Lord when he sees dishonest activity. But again, it's talking about business because it talks about dishonest scales. And the Hebrew word dishonest here means to be deceitful. You are deceiving people on the scales. I said a minute ago I was going to explain in a little more detail what that meant. In ancient times, in doing business transactions, they had weights, stones. And a businessman would use one set of stones to buy something from you and another set of stones to sell something to you. So when he was going to buy something from you, he put the heavy stones on. And when he was going to sell something to you, he put the lighter stones on. Did I get that right? I thought about that all week. <laughs> At any rate, it has to do with stones and a scale. And you could cheat. You could be dishonest in your business transactions based on what you put on the scales. Now, we don't do that anymore uh, very much. But this would be something like the, the butcher putting his thumb on the steak on the scale to add a little weight. It would be like uh, the farmer feeding his cow a lot of salt so he would drink a lot of water before he took him to market. It would be like the salesman padding his expense account. All of that is the idea. A rancher had a horse who um, sometimes limped. 
And he went to the veterinarian and he said, what do I do with this horse? And the vet examined the horse and said, sell him when he's not limping. <laughs> that is the dishonest scale that Solomon has in mind. Don't be dishonest in a business transaction. Another proverb says something very similar. Proverbs 20 verse 10 says, Diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Notice 11.1 and 20.10 both talk about an abomination. 11.1 talks about dishonest scales. Uh, 20.10 talks about diverse weights, but it's all basically the same idea. The customer is being deceived by the merchant. The merchant is making money dishonestly. One commentator said that in this case it includes the practice of demanding stricter standards from others than we do ourselves. Interesting application. M. R. Dahan made the same application. He said, too often people have two standards, one for private use and one for public application to others. We measure ourselves by a different standard than we do our neighbor. So, again, the idea is simply being dishonest, and it is repugnant to the Lord to use two different standards. There's a third proverb that says the same thing. It's 20, verse 23. It says, diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord, and dishonest scales are not good. Now, uh, 2023, as compared to 20 verse 10, simply adds dishonest scales. But in both cases, it's dishonest business practices, and Solomon is saying that is repugnant. It is disgusting to the Lord. So, what does the book of Proverbs say about dishonesty? Uno. One. It's disgusting. Disgusting to the Lord. Now, I looked at all of this and I thought, how's that going to apply to the people I'm speaking to Sunday? I mean, after all, uh, we all work, but how many are business people with scales? And that got me to thinking, hmm, are there certain professions you trust more than others? I mean, we joke about that, you know, but what are the facts? Uh, and so I, Google is a wonderful thing when you want some information. I Googled it. And I came up with a Gallup poll for 2019. I guess that's the latest it's got. And this was the question they asked people. Please tell me how you would rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in different fields. And here were the choices. Very high, high, average, low, very low. Now I'm going to run through the results, but you need to know before I do this. They took everybody who said very high or high and they lumped them together. So uh, what profession would you give a high or very high mark to for honesty? And I got a long list here. But let me ask you. I, you know, I've threatened before to hand out three by five cards and have you write the answer and get somebody to tell him real quick. Who, who would you say? Uh, what profession? What professional would you say has the highest level of trust? Teachers. Teachers? Who help? Huh? Preacher? 
Uh, that's fast declining. It used to, there was a time, and the article said that, there was a time when preachers would have been at the top no longer. I'll get back to them in a minute. Nurses. Nurses. 85%. This is the highest for the 16th year in a row. What's second? This one will really surprise you. I never would have figured this one out. Engineers. 66% of Americans put faith in those professions who design bridges, dams, planes, medical devices, and other things we count on for safety and reliability. Number three. Medical doctors. Number four. Druggist, physicians, <laughs> pharmacists. pharmacists, yeah, not drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, dentist. And what I thought was interesting of those of that group, uh, four of the five were in the medical profession. Engineers got in there, but we trust people in the medical profession. Interesting. Now. I'm not sure I have them listed in order. Uh, I think there may be categories that weren't listed. I saw two different lists and one had more in it than the other. And uh, so there may be some people left out after this, but this is a basic idea. The next on this list was police officers. Now keep in mind, this was done in 2019 before the BLM movement. I don't know what it would be today. But 54% said they would trust uh, police officers. By the way, medical doctors, it was 65. Pharmacists, it was 64. Dentist, it was 61. Police officers, it was 54. College teachers, it was 49. We're getting lower and lower. Uh, psychiatrist, 43. Chiropractors, 41. Clergy, 40. And I wonder how much that has to do with the scandal in the priesthood and TV evangelists screaming for money all the time. <laughs> um, at any rate, it's 40%. In 2006, it was 58% for clergy. So, and by the way, that's the lowest it's been in 40 years. Journalist, 28%. Uh, Bankers, 28%. Labor union leaders, 24%. Lawyers. <laughs> now, you knew they were going to be toward the bottom, right? 22%. Business executives, 20%. State governors, 20%. And that was 2018, 19 I wonder what it would be today if they were taking it in this. Never mind. <laughs> Stockbrokers. I was surprised by this one, actually. Uh, maybe it's because of the firm I was associated with that was, had very, very high standards. But stockbrokers only have a 14% approval rating. Advertising uh, practitioners, 13%. Insurance salesmen, 13%. And now we get to the good stuff. <laughs> You're ready for the bottom of the barrel? The bottom of the barrel. Senators, 13%. Members of Congress, 12%. One more, and you could have guessed this one. Car salesmen, 9%. <laughs> I think I read one article where it, the bottom used to be congressmen and uh, car salesmen beat them out. <laughs> All right. The point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of perception, at least, that there's a lot of dishonesty in business practices. Would you agree with that? Yes. You know, I would. I know too many stories. Uh, I'm going to exercise some discipline and not tell them. But all of us know them. Uh, I looked for auto mechanics on here. It was in another list. It wasn't on the one 
that I got off the Gallup poll uh, itself. But uh, apparently, uh, auto mechanic. But they're the one. I, I think if you just ask somebody generally, they would put lawyers, car salesmen, and car mechanics uh, at the top of the list for dishonesty. All right. What does the book of Proverbs say about dishonesty? And the answer is that it is disgusting to the Lord. I don't care what profession you're in. It's disgusting for you to be dishonest. As far as the Lord is concerned. The second thing I want to say about dishonesty from the book of Proverbs is really interesting. At least the way it's stated. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 17. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. What a way to put it. I think he's using taste, obviously. Bread gained by deceit is sweet, and afterward... You feel like you've got a mouthful of gravel. So since he's using taste, let me piggyback on that and say that it's distasteful to be dishonest. But not at first. But not at first. At first, it may be sweet. There's something satisfying about ill-gotten gain, as they would say. There's something satisfying about sin in general. Do you know the Bible says that? The Bible says there's pleasure in sin. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, talks about the pleasures of sin. And then it adds this little phrase, for a season. In the short term, you may be satisfied with sin, or in this case, dishonesty. But ultimately, it is dissatisfying to the soul. I looked at all of this and I thought, yeah, that's true, if you have a conscience. I think a sociopath might not experience this, but any normal average person would say, You know, it's sweet at the beginning and it's a mouthful of gravel. Can you think of a more disgusting (laughs) thing to put in your mouth? Good night. And he says, so in the long haul, it just isn't going to be satisfying. So it is distasteful to you and it is disgusting to the Lord. A Sunday school teacher was discussing this subject And she said to the small children in class, would you lie for a penny? And they all said no. She said, would you lie for a nickel? And they said no. She said, would you lie for a quarter? And they all said no. And then she said, would you lie for a thousand quarters? They had to think about that one. And then one little shaver spoke up and said, I wouldn't do it even for a thousand quarters. And the teacher said, why not? And the little kid said, because when the quarters have been spent and the things bought with them are gone, the lie would still be there. You see, teacher, A lie sticks. That's the point of the proverb. It may be sweet at the beginning. It's like a mouthful of rocks at the end. So it is disgusting to the Lord. And it will be dissatisfying to you. One more thing. The book of Proverbs says about dishonesty. I promised you three. The first is it's disgusting to the Lord. The second is that it's going to be distasteful in the long run to you. And the third is it could be downright dangerous to you. 
Look at Proverbs 28, 22. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. All right, this fellow has an evil eye. And again, it has to do with money. And he has an evil eye for, toward riches. And that implies certainly dishonesty, the evil eye. He has a get-rich-quick scheme. And it says he doesn't know that it's not going to work. It's going to lead to poverty. And that's why I say it is dangerous. When you are dishonest, you never know not just how distasteful that'll be if you have a conscience at all, not just how much it displeases the Lord, but how much trouble it could get you into. You could be covetous, which is what a lot of commentators want to apply this verse, uh, for riches and end up in poverty. So there's this race for riches and you lose, you come in last, you come in poverty stricken. So the get rich quick scheme ends up costing you money. Now, the consequences in this verse is poverty. But it just seems to me that this one is highlighting the fact that there are negative consequences to being dishonest. So I thought, in what areas uh, are people dishonest? And I was really thinking about what, what, what other consequences are there? There was something on the news recently. Uh, I didn't bother to look it up because I went in another direction. But um, isn't there a city councilman that just got indicted with a bunch of felonies. You heard that story? Yeah, yeah. One of the city councilmen in Los Angeles. Um, I didn't go there because uh, it hasn't been tried yet. But that gave me an idea. How many politicians have uh, been dishonest? I mean, that was on our list that, you know, members of Congress were pretty low. And I thought, boy, I'll bet that's a fertile field. So I did a little digging, and I came up with a most fascinating list. As a matter of fact, I, I cut and paste the list, and it was 10 pages. All congressmen, senators or congressmen or political officials, one way or another, in federal government, going all the way back to the 18th century. So let me just give you a sample. You ready? Listen to this. In 1798, Matthew Lyon was the first congressman to be recommended for censure. He was recommended for censure for spitting on another congressman. I thought it was bad today. Maybe it was as bad back then. That censure vote failed. He wasn't convicted. But later he was found guilty of violating the Alien and Sedition Acts and was sentenced to 30 months in jail, during which time he was reelected. <laughs> and that's what caught my attention. Who's dishonest here? Why do we have dishonest leaders? Because we elect them. As a matter of fact, I once lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and this actually happened. The sheriff was indicted, and as I recall, convicted, ran for office, and was reelected. <laughs> now, who's dishonest, the leaders or the led? It gets better. As a matter of fact, I skipped through the list because if I went through it thoroughly, we'd be here way into the afternoon. But in 1841, Charles Mitchell, a representative from New York, was convicted of forgery and sentenced to a year in prison. In 1922, Albert Fall, Secretary of the Interior, was the first U.S. cabinet member to be convicted of a crime. He took a bribe involving the Teapot Dome Federal Oil Reserve in Wyoming and spent two years in prison. 
1926, John Langley, a representative from Kentucky, was caught taking a bribe, uh, of trying to bribe, excuse me, a probation officer. He was sentenced to two years in prison. And after which his wife, Kathleen, ran for Congress in his place and was elected to two full terms. In 1931, a fellow named Han, uh, Harry Robottom, a representative from Indiana, was convicted of accepting bribes from people who sought post office appointments and served a year in Leavenworth. In 1935, Michael Hogan, a representative from New York, was convicted of bribery and sentenced to a year and a day, day in federal penitentiary. In 1947, Andrew May, a representative from Kentucky, was convicted of accepting bribes from a war ammunitions manufacturer and was sentenced to nine months in prison. In 1950, Parnell Thomas, a representative from New Jersey, was convicted of salary fraud and given 18 months in prison as well as a fine and I could go on and on and on. I deliberately stopped at 1950 because I figured you wouldn't remember any of those names and I wouldn't get into trouble of mentioning people you knew. But you know politicians who pull some pretty crooked stuff. So, let's sum this up. According to the book of Proverbs, God delights in honesty. And dishonesty? <laughs> That's disgusting to the Lord, distasteful to you, and could be dangerous for you in getting into all kinds of trouble. Now, I want to conclude by making a couple of suggestions. And the first is this. you will be tested. I think at a very practical, personal level, we're all tested more than we're aware. I think we get tested pretty regularly as to whether or not you'll be honest. I think it would be interesting to have a little session about this and just talk about all the ways you face. Am I going to be honest in this situation? Because I think we all face it all the time. Years ago, there was a professor at Vanderbilt University who taught math. And when he gave the exam at the end, he said this, and I'm going to quote him. Today I'm giving you two exams, one in trigonometry and the other in honesty. I hope you will pass them both. If you must fail one, fail trigonometry. There are many good people in the world who couldn't pass a trig test, but there are no good people in the world who cannot pass the examination of honesty. And what struck me about that story, if you're a student taking an exam, you're faced with honesty. I think when you're given the wrong change too much at the grocery store, you're tested. We're all tested, I think, all the time. A number of years ago, Douglas Aircraft Company was competing with Boeing to sell Eastern Airline its first big jets. War hero Eddie Rickenbacker, the head of Eastern Airlines, reportedly told Donald Douglas that the specifications and claims made by the Douglas Company for the DC-8 were close to Boeing's on everything except noise suppression. Rickon Becker then gave Douglas one last chance to out-promise Boeing on this feature. After consulting his engineers, Douglas reported that he didn't feel like he could make that promise. Rickenbecker replied, I know you can't. I just wanted to see if you were still honest. You never know when you're being tested. So the first thing I want to say is, remember, you're being tested. The second thing I want to say is, remember the Lord. You see, what struck me in this particular study 
is that if you had said to me, should you be honest, I'd say, yeah, for crying out loud, my mother taught me that. My mother, boy, let me tell you, did my mother teach me that. Her big thing was, just don't lie to me. You can do anything, just don't lie. Yes, ma'am. You know, I mean, who doesn't know that, right? But what struck me is how often, three different times, the book of Proverbs says, you better be honest because being dishonest is disgusting to the Lord. So remember, you're going to be tested. And when you are, remember the Lord. This is disgusting to him. Any form of honesty is disgusting. So remember the Lord. The first governor general of Australia was a man I never heard of. His name was Lord Hopeton. One of the most cherished possessions he had was a 3,300-year-old ledger he had inherited from John Hope, one of his ancestors. He had been in business in Edinburgh, where he first used that old ledger. That governor general of Australia got his hands on that ledger, and he looked at it carefully, and the first thing he noticed was an inscription on the first page, which said, and again I quote, O Lord, keep me and this book honest. Father, Thank you for this reminder of how you think of the simple little thing of honesty in so many cases. But Lord, may it serve as a reminder to us to remember you in all that we do and all those things that we say, those little judgments we make, as well as our business transactions to be, honor, to be honest because Lord, it delights you, not just mother. In Jesus' name, amen.